Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We were waiting for the conference line connection. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Billy Wilson. I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. Uh, today's lecture is part of the conservation lecture series. You can view uh, upcoming lectures, uh, excuse me, register to attend lectures or watch videos of past lectures on the website that you see here listed on this first slide. Here is a schedule of our upcoming lectures. Please note that the uh, Bighorn Sheep Lecture has been moved to February 6th and will be here in Sacramento instead of down south. I believe it was in Ontario that was the original location. For today's lecture, I ask that audience members uh, please hold all questions till the end so that I can come around with the wireless microphone and those that are listening on WebEx can hear your questions. For those of you on WebEx, you can type your questions into the chat box, and I will read those questions for the instructor or the, excuse me, the presenter at the end. So today I'm pleased to have uh, to introduce Dr. Deborah Ayers presenting a lecture on rare plants in Pine Hill. Dr. Ayers studied the population biology of El Dorado mules ears, one of the rare species of Pine Hill for her PhD at UC Davis. As a project scientist at UC Davis, she focused on rapid evolution of corded grasses in tidal marshes and speciation in tumbleweeds, but also found time to work on rare species in chaparral and vernal pools and on plant communities of Pine Hill, the topic of today's talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ayers. Thank you very much. Um, the heart of my talk today is a paper that was published in Madronio in 2009 with, with this title and by these authors, uh, but I'm going to lead you, lead you to it gently. Um, this is a picture of, of Pine Hill from the 1930s, and Pine Hill today festooned with cell phone towers and um, uh, uh, big fences, so a secure uh, site now and houses. When I talk about Pine Hill, I'm not actually talking about the hill itself, though that is in the center of this area. I'm talking about this ecological island that is, um, surrounds Pine Hill. So Pine Hill is in the center of this ecological island, which extends from Highway 50 South um, in Cameron Park to where Salmon Falls Road meets the South Fork of the American River. So when I talk about Pine Hill, I'm talking about more than just the hill itself. To, to define uh, some of the parts of the title of this talk, what is a biodiversity hotspot? This is an area where there's a disproportionate number of species relative to the area, disproportionate to other areas. As many as 44% of all plant species are confined to 25 hotspots globally, and these comprise uh, less than 2% of the land area of the planet. Some of these areas, you, you probably are not surprised, are in the tropics, in here, um, but also in Mediterranean climate areas like Australia, uh, South Africa, the Mediterranean, uh, the west coast of Chile. Oh dear, why did you do Why I like a map. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, we'll just have to visualize, and the California Floristic Province, uh, which you all know where California is. So these Mediterranean areas are biodiversity hotspots, as are these tropical areas and island areas. Flora versus vegetation. So a flora is a list of plant species found in an area, like the flora of Pine Hill would be a list of species. A vegetation refers to the the type of uh, plants that grow there, the, the form of that, for example, grasslands, chaparral, woodland, and so forth. So when we talk about flora and vegetation, we're talking about two different things. California has three floristic provinces. The first one, that biodiversity hotspot, is the California Floristic Province, which is west of the transverse and Sierra Nevada Mountains. We also have a little bit of the Great Basin uh, flora, and also our desert flora. And all of these combine together 
to uh, make California as a state an area of high species richness. Over 7,000 plant taxa, uh, almost 6,000 native taxa, over 1,000 species are introduced from other places. Of our natives, uh, 1,416 are endemic species. That means that they are restricted to California only. Endemism is, is when, a, when a species is restricted to a particular area on the planet. Um, 26 of those endemic species are extinct. The Pine Hill Ecological Island has 741 plant species and subspecies, of which uh, 580 or so are native and 160 are introduced. It includes eight rare species, four or five of which, depending on how liberal you are in your interpretation, are endemic to the Pine Hill area. It encompasses 30,000 acres in the Sierra Nevada foothills and is a biodiversity hotspot, less than um, half of uh, Five one hundredths of one percent of the area of California contains one tenth uh, or ten percent of the species. So how does uh, how does that compare on a worldwide basis? New Caledonia, one of the most species-rich areas in the world, has 0.18 species per square kilometer. Uh, the Cape in South Africa, another Mediterranean climate area, has 0.11 species. The California floristic province as a whole has a much smaller number of species, and Pine Hill has over seven species per square kilometer. So it has a, a, a truly a staggering number of plant species. In conservation, we try to maximize our bang for the buck because the bucks usually are very small. Um, one of the strategies would be to preserve areas that are particularly rich in species. So think about this. We could conserve 10% of the flora by preserving this tiny fraction of the land. The first step in the conservation of this area was to identify the endangered and threatened species that um, the flora contain. And we do that because threatened and endangered species are the drivers because of the, Eco uh, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the mid-1980s master's thesis by Jim Wilson, the first author on the paper, was on the flora and vegetation of Pine Hill and formed the foundation for this, uh, this listing. He discovered uh, these six rare species, um, there arguably are a couple more, uh, that grow in this, uh, on, this, on this ecological island. Stebbins Morning Glory, distinctive because of these highly dissected leaves, so unlike other morning glories, it's a, a trailing sort of a semi-woody perennial that is relatively short-lived. The Pine Hill Ceanothus is a prostrate shrub. Pine Hill Flannel Bush stands about three to four feet tall, uh, is a shrub, and it has these bronzy uh, yellow flowers. You might be familiar with uh, California flannel bush, which is very much taller and has um, those bright yellow flowers. Uh, El Dorado mule's ears, my favorite plant, uh, is a long live, very long live, very broadly spreading perennial in the daisy family. Uh, El Dorado bed straw, not much is known about because it's only about, about this big, so it's not uh, doesn't come under study often, but here we see it after fire sprouting uh, from underground structures. And then uh, Lane's butterweed is also in the daisy family. It is a long live perennial, not nearly as broad spreading as the Wyethia from underground rhizomes. So the second step once these were identified is to list the species under the Endangered Species Act. And part of uh, that requirement is to identify the threats to the species. But keep in mind that little protection is given to plants, whereas a great deal of protection is given to animals. If you had one of these plants growing on your property, you could spray it with Roundup or put a house on it, and nobody would say anything. If you tried to put a house on a kit fox, then you'd be susceptible to a $10,000 fine. So the threats to these species, we're going to focus down at the Cameron Park area. And this is a, uh, a Google uh, image from 1993. And you can see that uh, residential development had proceeded at quite a, a vigorous pace down there. Very few areas were left open. And uh, the remaining areas were um, owned by people who wanted to develop them. 
um, it was very contentious at the time to get these species listed. Let me just say that and then stop. Wilson's master's thesis formed the foundation for the listing of these five species. They were eventually listed in 1996 for as endangered and one as threatened. The third step then to protect these plants was to find a federal nexus, and I'm kind of speaking outside of my knowledge here. I'm only repeating what people have told me who are familiar with the politics of these things. Uh, the underlying rationale is that no federal agency can do anything that threatens a listed species, plant or animal, and so the goal was to find that federal nexus, and it was found. The Bureau of Reclamation, a federal agency, uh, provides water for residential development in El Dorado County, and it was determined that the more water they gave El Dorado County, the more development there will be. So that was the, the uh, that was the uh, the hammer, and the result was the establishment of preserves throughout this ecological island, from um, the south in Cameron Park to all the way to Salmon Falls Road. Almost 5,000 acres are preserved now under various ownerships. Um, this is an older map. Uh, there is uh, uh, additional uh, preserve areas uh, linking these two these two preserves in Kanaka Valley. And this is what Cameron Park looked like a few years back. And those areas um, are now under uh, preserves. They are preserves. Still surrounded by houses, which makes management of the preserves a little problematic. But so I keep talking about Pine Hill as an ecological island. Pine Hill is in the center of this footprint. Uh, what does that really mean? Why is it there? Pine Hill is an island of gabbro soil that was derived from the magma chamber of an ancient volcano. This volcano was pushed off its connection to the magma and shoved into the Sierra Nevada foothills through continental drift a long time ago. Soils developed on the top of it that are called gabbro soils, so that footprint is an area that is primarily gabbro soil derived from these um, igneous rocks from this volcano. Other soils in the area are derived from granite, metamorphic, and serpentine rocks. This area also is variable topographically from hilltops like Pine Hill to uh, river canyons like the South Fork of the American River and creeks and meadows. And here's a soil map. This area here in the pale pink with the, the town of Rescue is that gabbro soil um, area. You can also see that there's a variety of different soils. Uh, this bright pink are serpentine soils. There's granite soils, metamorphic soils, and so forth, and some of those intrude into the gabbro area. So now I'm going to turn to this, uh, this paper that we wrote. Uh, Wilson did all the field work for his master's thesis in uh, 1986. He put out 138 plots that covered all vegetation and rock types. And from those plots, he took species data, both the, uh, uh, the ID and the cover. He took environmental data for each site, lots, lots of data, um, cover, plant cover, a slope aspect, apparent rock distance to water. He measured just about everything you could possibly think of, which is very cool. Um, he also walked around these various areas noting plant species. Not all the 710 species were present in his plot, and so he um, combined uh, various floras, various lists that people had developed, and um, noted down all the species to come up with the flora. He subjected uh, his data to um, a program called TwinSpan. Um, later, we subjected his data to Kanoko, a software program that wasn't available to him at the time. The TwinSpan program identifies plant communities, whereas the uh, Kanoko program IDs, the correlates of those communities, the, the environmental correlates. 
from uh, his twin span, he identified uh, three men vegetation types, oak woodlands, grasslands, and chaparral, which is pretty much what we already knew, but it's nice to have the data. Rare species were mostly in chaparral. One was in a woodland chaparral transition area. None are in the grasslands. He found uh, 741 distinct taxa, including 91 subspecies, some species of ferns and lichens, from uh, 91 families, 376 uh, genera, the uh, Asteraceae, the, the daisy family, and Poaceae, the grass family, accounted for um, uh, almost 200 of those species. Uh, the percent of native plants varied um, where you were looking. In chaparral, woodland, and on serpentine soils, there was a high percentage of native, native plants. On grass, in the grasslands and on granite soils, there was uh, relatively fewer native species present. I'm going to do this quick so it doesn't hurt either of us. Uh, Kanoko is a statistical software program that does canonical correspondence analysis. So you can read the wiki definition, which is kind of impenetrable, and let me explain it to you. If you're familiar with principal components, it's sort of like that. It takes all the variation in the data. In this case, it will be it's the distribution of those species and the environmental variables, but basically the species, and it puts them on an XY graph. So we have an X axis and a Y axis, which don't mean anything. That's kind of hard to swallow if you have never done this or looked at this kind of statistic before. You want to know what the Y means. Well, uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's a statistical program decided to make up these axes, and then it it, it plots the individual species with the species that they are associated with from the plot work. So this species is frequently associated with that. They end up in the same area of this XY plane. And then the canonical part is where the variables that were measured by Wilson, the slope and the aspect and so forth, are also plotted in this XY um, two-dimensional grid so that you can intuit or infer or assume what those the XY axes really mean. All right, so that was really long-winded, but I'll show you the picture then. Okay, so it's not as frightening as it would have been had I not explained it, right? Yeah. All right, so this is the output from Kanoko. It only includes the 100 most common species and the rare species, so it doesn't include the full data set because then we couldn't be able to read it. Um, what we see is I have, I have highlighted various areas. The green is the grassland area. The, <clears throat> the, the blue and the yellow are chaparral, and the pink is the woodland area. And um, essentially what the x-axis is looking at is shrub cover. High shrub cover um, is found in that area of the graph where we have chaparral. No shrub cover is found over there. Uh, and this is high tree cover in this area, so we know that's a, a woodland. He also um, had um, a variable that uh, he, he, it was a, uh, he just called it whether it was woodland or shrubland or whatever. So we know this is a woodland because there it says woodland. And over here it says grassland. And over here it says chaparral. Okay, so let's move on and look at separate areas. This is the woodland. It contains um, the bed straw. The green arrow points at the bed straw. We know that it's oak dominated because these four letter abbreviations are how botanists refer to plants. The two letters of the genus Quercus are the oaks. The two letters of the species, Wislazenii, for example. So a lot of, lot of QUs here means a lot of oaks. Um, we also have, uh, this is uh, Toxicodendron diversiloba, which we all know is poison oak, um, also occurs in the woodlands. Other associates are um, high water, um, high tree cover, high native species. It's a high, highly diverse area, evenly distributed. The species are there aren't really, really common species and really, really rare species. They're all about the same. Where we find it uh, is on north-facing slopes, near water and the metamorphic parent rock, um, it might, might be underlying the area. That meta is the parent rock, though it's not very strong. They're all on, they're all on gabbro, but some are on metamorphic. 
and this is what it looks like. Um, this, this is actually a pretty open oak woodland. There are areas of oak woodland that you can't walk through. They have um, high ground cover. They have um, poison oak hanging from the trees. Um, perhaps you wouldn't, wouldn't want to walk through it. Um, these are kind of open areas that I've taken pictures of. 219 species were found in the woodland. 76% were native, and it covered 28% of the Pine Hill area. So look, turn now to the chaparral, and both of these are chaparral. They are uh, both of them dominated, but this one especially so, by uh, manzanita and chemise. The arrows again point to the rare species that are found in that particular area. Um, it is associated with high shrub cover, high diversity. This type of chaparral is mostly on south-facing slopes with deeper soil, and gabbro and serpentine are the, the parent rocks that you're going to find underneath these sh uh, shrubs. The second type of chaparral, and again, manzanita and chemise are um, sizable components of the vegetation. I don't mean to imply that they are not, but they also include toyon, redbud, coffee berry, and um, holly leaf red berry, some of these um, other shrubs that are not manzanita and not chemise. And in fact, um, Melanie Google Prokhorot for her PhD, she examined this very question and found that in areas where the combined cover of these species was greater than 3% were areas where you would find um, the Eldorado mule's ears and Lane's butterweed. So these areas, again, are characterized by shrub cover, high diversity, and the rare species. They are on non-south-facing slopes, so their exposure to the sun is moderated, meaning they are cooler. The sun doesn't drive as much evaporation. They are gentler sites. They are also on steeper slopes. And this is what they look like. That first kind of chaparral is over. I can do this without. Where's my camera? Um, the, the gray foliage is Arctostaphylos visida, our manzanita. And in the foreground, you can see uh, re sprouting chemise. This was bladed off by a bulldozer, and these re sprouted. The chemise is also in the chaparral. This gray pine is, in fact, gray pine. Uh, and then this is a, a more northwest facing slope, and you can hopefully see that we've got other things there. Um, certainly you can see the, the flowering of the red bud. The chaparral contained 190 species, three quarters of which were native and covered uh, about 45% of the Pine Hill area. The last community that, that he examined is the grassland. And the arrows that go to grassland are high disturbance, high exotic species. They're on granite soils, and uh, they are grasslands. These are dominated by exotic annual grasses, um, the brome species, um, the uh, wild oat species. The story index um, is an um, estimate of how good that land would be for agriculture. Um, it's only mapped on basically how level it is because they don't know how rocky that soil is, but they're basically meadows, level meadows. And that's what the grasslands look like, so grasslands, but then uh, we also have some very nice native wild wildflowers that managed to uh, come up in the grasslands. 149 species, 36% uh, natives, and it covers 27% of the Pine Hill area. This is an area dominated by exotic annual grasses. And at one time, some of the areas might have been chaparral that were put through what's called type conversion. If you uh, remove the chaparral by fire or blading uh, a couple of times, uh, then the chaparral goes away and you get grassland and the chaparral never comes back. And early branches, of course, uh, did this because cows eat grass, they don't eat manzanita. So a lot of areas were, underwent type conversion. Turning now to the chaparral, where uh, most of the rare species hang out, it is a shrub-dominated vegetation type. It is a controversial vegetation type, um, especially in Southern California, but also here. The rare species occur as understory species, meaning that they are not dominant, and they have to go through a long interfire period as an a understory. 
It's dominated by manzanita and chemise. And the reason it's controversial is because when it catches on fire, it really burns well. This was a control burn in uh, 1992. You can see the, uh, the gentleman in the orange uh, jumpsuit standing around watching it and the hose uh, that ex extended half a mile connected to a tanker truck to control that thing. It was uh, actually kind of terrifying. I, I wasn't sure I could run back up the hill if that fire escaped. In Chaparral, fire restarts succession. I, I once had somebody say, so when, when does it become a forest? And the answer is never. It never becomes an oak woodland. It never becomes a pine forest. It can become a meadow, but you have to do it deliberately. But it will never become anything other than Chaparral. Fire restarts um, the plant succession, and um, historically, it probably burned in patches. So you would have one patch that burned last year and a patch that burned 10 years ago and a, plant, a patch that hadn't burned at all. And this introduces temporal variation to the landscape. You have heterogeneous patches burned at different times containing different suites of species. So this might be part of the, ex the explanation as to why this area is so diverse. The fire dynamics, uh, uh, fire burns, yeah. And then there's a period of growth uh, where the plants uh, get bigger and eventually the canopy closes into mature chaparral. And then uh, there is a long interfire period, 60, 80, 100 years, or shorter, but it can be very, very long, um, during which that, that vegetation remains static. Uh, maybe the manzanita gets a little taller, but it's, uh, it, it stays just as it is until fire then resets it. And when fire goes through the chaparral, it reaches temperatures on the ground in excess of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is nothing left. There is on the surface. It is, it is cinder and ash and nothing. Plant dynamics are very simple. Uh, sexually reproductive plants, mature plants, produce seeds. Those seeds germinate to seedlings. The seedlings grow into mature plants, and the cycle goes around. If it's an annual plant, it does it in one year. A mature plant produces seeds in the spring. They lay dormant in the soil until the fall. Then they, you get seedlings, what we're seeing now, and they grow into mature plants, and, and then the plants die after flowering. If you're a biennial, it takes two years. If you're a bristlecone pine, the sequence might take um, centuries. We overlay the fire dynamics on the plant dynamics. It gets very complicated. This is one of the difficulties in managing chaparral, is that each plant has a, uh, can have a different way of responding to fire, of responding to the long interfire period. Is it a seedling? Is it a, uh, is it a seed at that stage? Will it flower? Um, what is the fate of the mature plants and of the seedlings? So in order to manage chaparral, all these various dynamics have to be considered. And uh, Graciela Hinshaw, who is the manager of the Pine Hill Preserve is sitting in the audience, and I'm sure she would agree it's a complicated puzzle to put together. Plants have different strategies to cope with fire. They can either re-sprout from below ground roots, rhizomes, or corms. This is uh, uh, El Dorado mule's ears in the spring following a fire. Um, this is, these are not seedlings, these are re-sprouts from rhizomes. And then that year, that same year, it will flower like that. So the plant's response to fire is to uh, grow vigorously and flower that first year. And then uh, it flowers less in succeeding years. On the other hand, there's another strategy where seeds are germinated, uh, germinate due to fire-based cues. Now, um, the reason this all works is that soil is a really good insulator. An inch of soil can take that 1,800 degree Fahrenheit fire and reduce the temperature to 200 degrees, which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. It kills the seeds of the mule's ears, but it promotes the germination of the morning glory and the, um, and the ceanothus. It, it also kills some of those seeds, too. Those plants will not germinate without the heat of fire. Two inches of soil, and they're, and they're, and they're looking pretty good. The heat uh, at, at one inch of soil can range from 90 to 200 degrees. So there is quite a lot of um, insulation. 
the rhizomes of the mule's ears can extend down about uh, five inches, so there is plenty of insulation for that plant by the soil. Going back now up to the um, results from the Wilson study, looking at these two distinct chaparrales. The strategies that we find for those plants to cope with fire differ. Those on uh, the more xeric sites, we've called it, on the south-facing slopes, dominated by manzanita and chemise, primarily adopt a seeding strategy. They are killed by fire and must come back through seedlings. And if you think about what that environment is like for a minute, it's char, so the soil is black. It absorbs a lot of heat. There is no water in the summer. The seeds germinate in the spring, and they only have a narrow window to put down whatever roots they possibly can, and then they have to survive through months and months of heat and drought. And it takes a special kind of plant to do that, and the plants that we find on these south-facing slopes are special. They are able to do this. On the slopes with more moderate exposure where you don't have that tremendous heat, we find re-sprouting species. So the, the plants over here are re-sprouters, or a lot of them, and the plants over here are reseeders. Now, the uh, chemise also sprouts. It sprouts and recedes. It's got kind of a dual strategy. So on these two uh, subtypes, on the more moderate slopes, we find toyon with the red berries, coffee berry with the gray leaves, and of course red bud we all know with beautiful flowers. On the southwest facing slopes, we have manzanita, chemise, ceanothus, and uh, sonoma sage. Now, these are not, um, I don't wish to imply that only re-sprouters grow on these moderate slopes. They still have manzanita, they still have chemise, but they all kind of duke it out together over the long interfire period. And it turns out that each of those chaparral types has its own suite of listed species, rare species. And they adopt the strategy of the plants that grow there. So on the, the music sites, we have the re-sprouting species of the mules here, the butterweed, and the um, bedstraw. On those hotter sites, we have germinating seeds of ceanothus, the morning glory, and flannel bush. The flannel bush also resprouts from its roots. So um, it's clear that we have a couple of different strategies going on in, the, in this chaparral that we need to be aware of in order to conserve both types of chaparral for their particular suites of species. So the conclusions of the paper, and, and we had hoped when we really analyzed it carefully using all of those variables and all of those high statistical techniques, that we would come up with an answer. Why Why is it so diverse? One of the reviewers actually said, well, there's just all these reasons why it's diverse. And it's like, well, yeah. There isn't a single reason why uh, this area has such high diversity. Rather, it's a combination of all these different reasons. First of all, there are three vegetation types, each having its own suite of species. There are variable soils, gabbro, but also serpentine, granitic soils, metamorphic soils. It is variable topographically, which creates microhabitats, mini habitats, north facing slopes, south facing slopes, canyons, and hilltops. There is variation in disturbance due to fire, so temporal variation. There is a rich weed flora, which we sometimes would like to ignore. And there's high endemism on both the gabbro and serpentine-derived soils. Serpentine is um, sometimes thought to be similar to gabbro. I would argue it is not. Serpentine is almost toxic in its chemical makeup, whereas gabbro, I, I gardened in gabbro soil, a vegetable garden, for years. And as long as you remove the rocks, which are frequent and large, um, you can end up with some pretty good soil. Uh, serpentine is high in heavy metals and high in magnesium and, and can be toxic to most of our ornamentals. So the conservation of Pine Hill is hinged upon the listing of threatened endangered species because those are the drivers according to the Endangered Species Act. The strategy was to establish preserves throughout the area to preserve these plants. 
The goal for now and in the future is to manage the preserves for the rare species, but also to ensure the ecological functioning of those preserves. What this, uh, these data has shown is that both types of chaparral must be preserved. Now that we recognize that there's two subtypes, both types must be preserved. And I think that the uh, preserves as they exist do that. It's not like uh, you have to crawl through mature chaparral to find the endangered species. What we know is that we can use these common plants as indicators of suitable habitat for the rare species. And if you've ever crawled through chaparral, you're never quite sure whether you should go over the branch or under the branch or try and follow the rabbit trail. And Yeah, it's not something that you want to do, and, and Jim Wilson actually did the crawling and the traveling when he did this, the sampling for his master's thesis, and hats off to you, Jim, for that. Um, so we can use those common species, those re-sprouting species, to indicate suitable habitat for the mule's ears, the butterweed, and the bedstraw. We can use the lack of those species and the dominance by manzanita and chemise as an indicator of suitable habitat for the ceanothus, the morning glory, and the flannel bush. Uh, the flannel bush is pretty much confined to Pine Hill, so that kind of goes off the, off the radar quickly. In the, um, the conservation now, the, the management gets a little dicey, but it can be based on the type of chaparral you're trying to manage. The chaparral type one would be prescribed burning. And you saw that picture of Cameron Park, how the preserves are hemmed in um, by residential development. So you know that, that burning is, is controversial and um, it makes the local residents panic. Um, and, and as well they might, because it's, it is kind of frightening. So burning would be uh, the uh, management strategy for chaparral type 1 species, but a second fire will kill uh, your endangered species and, uh, in fact, the rest of the chaparral. Fire is a very strong stimulus for those seeds to germinate, and when the first fire goes through, they do. When the second fire comes through, there's no more seeds left to germinate, or, or very few. So you can convert your chaparral to a grassland by back-to-back -back burning. Well, what, what does that? There was a practice of over burn sites with uh, annual ryegrass uh, in an help, uh, help to hold the soil, or I don't know what the rationale is on level sites. And then these grasses, which get up to be about this high, uh, then form the fuels for the second fire. This has happened in Southern California. Uh, an arsonist lit the grass on fire and, and uh, almost wiped out an, an endangered species on the site. So it's not a, a trivial problem. Short interval fires must be avoided. These occur when there's over by grasses and you have uh, an arsonist or lightning. We in El Dorado County are well aware of the power of one man with a match given the King Fire, which burned almost 100,000 acres this past summer, it's hard to stop an arsonist. Uh, perhaps the best policy is to not over -sow with grasses, make bare zones around the preserve so that sparks from cars or lit cigarettes will not set the preserve on fire. But I would also like to add that long interval fires are okay. It's not like you're like, well, it's time to burn the chaparral, no. We'll wait 10 years, 20 years. Uh, the, it's kind of this idea that the chaparral gets senescent, which I think has been largely disproved. The chaparral just gets older. Management um, can differ on the type of chaparral, so burning might be prescribed for chaparral 1. For chaparral 2, uh, canopy removal by a grading might be a viable option since they re-sprout. When you remove the canopy, the plants re-sprout. The toyon, the coffee berry, the mule's ears, and so forth come back from underground structures. But research is, is needed to determine just how the whole community responds, not just the species that re-sprout. How well do the obligate cedars in that community come back during grading? And maybe Graciela have a few words about that. I know you were conducting some experiments a few years back on uh, grading and then masticating. Was that the word?
So, so what Graciela just said was that they, they used a machine called a, a masticator, or they would crush the vegetation down. They would gather the vegetation into piles, and then they would burn the piles in a prescribed burn. So a little bit different than um, a conflagration consuming a hillside or uh, a bulldozer blading a hillside, so kind of a combination of those two strategies. Uh, these are in areas where residential, uh, where houses surround uh, preserves, because clearly the escape of fire um, is to be avoided. Not a bad PR when the Forest Service lets those fires get away. And that's what it looks like when they do uh, bulldoze. They also drag these, uh, these heavy metal uh, beams across the landscape or have chains strung between two bulldozers to remove the vegetation. So the conservation of Pine Hill, in summary, was to establish preserves, to find techniques to manage those preserves, and to increase uh, public awareness of the uniqueness of Pine Hill, which we are doing today. So there is my contact information. And if you were to just Google Pine Hill Preserves, you would bring up both of those websites since they look long and complicated. And I, I thank you for your awareness. Questions of the audience. Hi, is uh, is any of the site being grazed? No, Graciela is saying no. And uh, again, cattle don't like to eat the grass, so I'm sure there's grazing in the grasslands, but they don't like the chaparral. Uh, they like the oak woodlands too, if they can get through it. But the focus of the preserves is on chaparral community, or are there oak woodlands interspersed in those areas? I'm sure the larger preserves have all three vegetation types. Is that is that true, Graciela? Oh, wait, wait a second. He wants to give you a microphone. Yes. Thank you. Um, the chaparral um, in the preserve areas, which uh, are state lands, federal lands, and El Dorado County lands, the chaparral covers um, two-thirds of those protected areas. And then the, the other one-third um, is a combination of the forest and the grassland. The grassland is minimum. The terrain is very, um, is not, you know, for the most part, not flat or meadowy on the protected areas again, and uh, except for Kanaka Valley. And so grazing is not even an option there. Um, and historically, the Kanaka Valley was grazed by cattle and horses, and you can still see the consequences of that with the vegetation composition, but in general, uh, grazing is not even an option there. Um, let's see, what else? Um, what was uh, your your question, Deborah, again, regarding? Uh, the, uh, earlier was the mass, how you, how you manage the vegetation in these okay. surrounded by houses. Uh, for the last, um, continuously for the last six years, we have been doing um, fuels reductions uh, for the benefit of the rare plants as well as for the protection of preserved lands and the houses that are adjacent. The way we do it is uh, not on extensive scale. We concentrate on what is called the urban wildlife um, interface. And uh, uh, so we cut vegetation on areas um, or on um, along areas 70 to 100 feet wide. And then we create what we call small piles, you know, around six feet diameter. And, and then we burn. Uh, it's not the way we want to do it. We would like to be able to uh, broadcast the burn but it's not possible at this time because of the logistic problems. Sometimes we are not burning at the time we want to burn because if it was going to be mimicking more naturally the processes that were there in the past, 
we will be burning during the summer, and we can't do that. So we do our best at keeping the habitat um, functional for the rare plants. Um, it's very interesting, um, Deborah, excellent uh, presentation. It's very interesting what you um, present regarding the two types of chaparral because that's definitely something that we um, can use to improve how we currently do the prescribed burning. And another very interesting thing, and that I am so glad to see, is that 50-plus uh, suggested interval for for fire occurrences because uh, because as you mentioned it's not easy to to get all the all the dogs in a row for for prescribed burning and if for the benefit of the vegetation and the species if we had to worry about that only once every 50 years yeah. That would be wonderful. Actually, wonderful. You don't have to burn it all. I mean, give yeah. It, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll be dead before you need to burn. <laughs> <laughs> Retire. Sorry, retired. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my I gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you. We, uh, one of the fires I examined, um, an oak tree had been killed by fire. And my husband and I, we, we cut off a, a chunk, and I counted the rings. There were 82 rings. That was the tree had had grown and it was over 82 years old in the last fire. So, and there was no problem. Uh, with, there was no problem with any of the plants coming back. There was no problem with the vegetation as it existed. So, um, this notion that you, you know, 30 years time, no, mm -mm, not in, not in our chaparral. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, kind of following following on this discussion. So these two strategies, the reseeding and the resprouting, um, for the management recommendations, the 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 uh, grading or the dragging of things behind is that kind of a um, trying to be a compromise in light of the surrounding houses to say there's a type of chaparral that could potentially be managed successfully for um, by that method because evolutionarily, you know, we wouldn't have had hu humans grading it, right? It would have all um, happened, evolved with fire. So uh, the, the sort of reasons behind that, that management recommendation, I'm j I was guessing but wanted to ask, is that to try to minimize the amount of chaparral that sort of must be managed by fire? Well, yes. Uh, like Graziella was saying, and um, I'm thinking of the Cameron Park Preserve because that's the one I know. That I did my my studies there. Um, there, there's no way you could have a fire there. Yet, um, you want those uh, species, all of the species, but especially the rare species, to go through their life cycle. Like the the Yithia will bloom in response to clearing. It doesn't matter whether it's a fire or a bulldozer. As with uh, as will the butterweed. So it waits two years to flower, which, which is not a good strategy, by the way. Um, so these, these plants will come back. They will flower. They will set seed and, um, and sort of rejuvenate the chaparral without having fire. I like uh, Graciela's strategy where they have these huge, essentially fire breaks, where they clear next to the, 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 the urban interface, but then they have small piles that they burn. So they're, the seeds that are waiting for fire will come up in those patches, um, in the graded areas, maybe not, though I have to say, on the other hand, when, the, when there has been grading, for example, the uh, morning glory will germinate. So it's almost as if the grading has scraped the seeds, and sometimes that might be enough for these seeds that are waiting for fire to kind of crack the seed coat. If you can scrape them, then the seed coat is thin, then they can germinate. So um, that's why studies have to be done to determine just how critical is fire for some of these species. Um, there's also been research that showed that some plants don't have to go through the heat of fire to germinate. There's something called charate, which um, is a sort of a made-up word that I can't even find on the web. But anyway, scientists made it up. Uh, charate, where the rain falls down, it goes through all the char, 
and uh, chemicals come out of the char. They're not quite sure what chemicals. And when those seeds are bathed in the chemicals from the charate, from, uh, they germinate in the absence of fire. So some plants can be cued to germinate by uh, just experiencing water that's been soaked in ash. So that suggests another strategy, just uh, scatter ash on the surface before the rain. Anything, anything but burning, especially in some of those areas. Although fire is is is, is very exciting to watch to watch this vegetation come come alive after fire. It's, it explains so much of the patterns that we see. Um, you, you will not understand the patterns until you set it on fire. <laughs> One woman with a match. Hi, when I when I went up to Pine Hill one time, um, the person I was with said, "Hey, take a look. There's this old track you can see here where a fire truck went through, and this was I can't remember how long ago that that fire went through, but it was probably you know at least on the order of 20 years." Um, and and he said that he, one of the downsides of gabbro soils is because they're old; they don't have a lot of nutrients, and so a lot of the plants are somewhat dependent on mycorrhizal associations that take a longer time to develop in, in soils that are poor, like gabbro soils. So I'm just wondering, you know, we're talking, you're talking about grading and what kind of impacts that might have on that. That's very interesting. Um, is the implication that fire uh, kills the mycorrhizae? Talking about this... He was pointing at the road, so he was saying you could still very clearly see the tire tracks from the ground disturbance. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't so much the, about the fire as about the about impacting the soil. That's interesting. I, that's not anything that um, I've ever considered. Yeah, and I, I just was curious. I would think that. that the fire would have more impact on the mycorrhizae, but then yeah. if they originate from under two inches, then maybe it's not a big deal, and they can quickly reestablish connections with those seedlings. I don't know um, how many of those species rely on mycorrhizae. I wouldn't be surprised to find that those those, south, those southern facing slopes, those species that can withstand that summer drought, uh, don't have mycorrhizal associates because it's just hard to see how a little seedling on its own little root could survive um, such such high dry conditions high temperatures. Another question? Yeah. Um, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just wondering if you um, noticed any changes on the rare plants, particularly I'm interested in the morning glory, but any of the other species on the closing of the canopy as the uh, chaparral matures, so not just you know, and getting the the germination, and but over time. I, 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 those experimental fires were part of my research, and before the fires, I did crawl through the chaparral. <coughs> the um, the ceanothus um, is pretty much wiped out. There might be a few kind of sick looking little plants under there, and the under mature chaparral. And then when you burn the chaparral, the area is full of seedlings, uh, so you know that they were there, but maybe there was just one in this area. Um, the morning glory disappears much, uh, much sooner, uh, about five years, and it's dead. So it's a, a shorter-lived uh, creature than the other ones. Um, the Waithia and presumably the Pacara, though I, I never crawled around, saw the, sorry, saw the butterweed, but the mule's ears, occurs as a very low growing non flowering understory. So it puts out, you know, maybe maybe uh, four leaves and it's very low to the ground underneath that mature canopy. Um, let's see. I don't know what the galium does. Nobody knows what the galium does. It's kind of plantus mysteriosus. It's and nobody wants to study it. It's so small and it's hard to find and you know, difficult. Um, intriguingly it though it does re sprout, which I'm not sure that we knew. We don't know with the secret life of plants. We don't really know what they're doing when they're not being watched. Um, so the morning glory um, is, is short-lived anyway. That, that's one of those species that might actually survive um, uh, a short interval fire. 
because it, it flowers the first year and sets seed and starts replenishing the soil seed bank. Um, and within a few years, it's, it's put a lot of seed into the soil before it, 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 it kind of dies out. Um, do you have any idea how long each of those plants may live? I mean, are you thinking like five years or just before the canopy probably oh, closes I think up naturally? The is capable of, of yeah. lasting um, all the way until fire kills it, so okay. it probably live 100 years. Okay. Um, the, the mule's ear that I studied, there was one plant, so I did a genetic fingerprinting. There was one plant that extended 360 square meters, so about the, the I don't know, the ground floor of this building is huge. It spreads by underground rhizomes about as big as around as my finger, and it's really rocky soil, as I kind of alluded to. So, uh, you know, you can kind of, and it doesn't grow that fast. So you think, how long does it take a plant to grow this vast area when it's running into rocks with its underground rhizomes at every turn and has to grow around them? And, I, I, my, my son's a mathematician. I asked him once how we figured out. And it's, it's just too many variables to figure out. But if somebody said that plant is a thousand years old, I would say, yeah, okay, a thousand years. And if it only grows during the interval when the canopy is open after fire and spends 50 years kind of just sitting there, even longer. So uh, I think it's a immense age for that particular plant. Um. Okay. That's the mule's ears, the, the, the daisy. Yeah. And um, one last question. Do you have any thoughts on um, how long the uh, flannel bush may live um, with That's that? That's a good question because it does okay. reach sprout after fire. Um, the top of it is killed off, and um, the seeds germinate in response to fire, though apparently they don't survive long enough to make a new plant. That's one of these plants that are, it's going to have to be helped. Grass heel is going to have to kind of help it along. A very cool study was done several years ago looking at the attrition of those seeds and seedlings from the flannel bush. And in the end, it was like 99.97 of the seeds didn't produce a seed. I mean, they were dead, dead. And the ones that seemed to survive were ones that fell into deep cracks where the rodents couldn't eat them and, and, and whatnot. But it does re-sprout after fire from roots. So individual plants could conceivably be ancient. Any other questions in the audience? Okay, any on WebEx? No? All right, well, thank you, Dr. Ayers, for your presentation. We appreciate it.